Okay. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, good morning. Okay. Uh, what's going on? Um, oh, someone in was removing someone else. Guys, please don't do that. Sometimes it takes a while for us to set the setting, but before then, please don't do that. It's not very nice. Okay, so for today, uh, we will not have a, a traditional lecture, uh, but uh, we will do a revision. So some of these questions for the revision might be quite similar to what your class test is going to look like. Some of this is going to be a little bit different, but it's going to be some of the topics that might pop up in your actual class tests. You might want to focus on these topics and some of these topics uh, might be there just to uh, improve your understanding on uh, public speaking in general. Uh, so we are going to proceed to do a revision for today. And for today's attendance, uh, I'm also going to take your attendance based on the submission of your uh, revision. Okay, so let me just share the link first. Um, okay. Let me share the link first. Okay, so for today, there are only uh, 14 questions. For your actual test, there will be 15 questions. Uh, so, for today, there will be two sections that you are going to complete. Okay, one is just uh, true or false. So most of your uh, class test questions are going to look something like this for your PSE uh, test. I'm going to give like some kind of scenario or situation and based on the scenario, on the situation, you're going to decide whether it's good, it's not good, and whether um, the speech uses any skills that you have learned uh, throughout the uh, 10 weeks and 11 weeks of your lessons. So for today, uh, there will be two parts of the revision questions. The first one is just true and false. So your actual test is going to look very similar to the first seven questions. So for the first seven questions, you're just going to read the scenarios and you're going to read the bolded statement and you're going to either uh, say it's true or false according to your understanding of what we've learned uh, throughout public speaking in English modules. So that's the first seven questions. And okay, the second one from eight to 14, uh, you are just going to list down based on the questions. So this is just a short response kind of questions. You're just going to list down based on the answer. If it wants you to list down one similarity of a speech, just list that down and then we'll go through uh, almost every possible answers later when we uh, discuss. And even though your class test is not going to be in this format, this is basically a short response question. Uh, all of your class test is going to be multiple choice questions. It's not going to be in this format, but this should help you to further understand or further revise on what we've learned so far. Some of these are going to pop up in your actual class test in a different form. Some of this might not uh, pop up in your classroom uh, test. So there are 14 questions that are going to finish. So let me just recap that again. Uh, question one, two, seven, uh, true and false. Question eight, to 14, you, it's basically a short response question. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is all of you are going to have around 20 minutes to answer the questions very quickly. 
And around 9 a.m., I uh, will come back here to discuss everything. So our discussion might take another 30 minutes, perhaps. Then after that, I'm going to introduce to you the format of your classroom tests and what are certain things that you might want to pay extra attention to uh, because I'm not able to include a revision that's 100% the same as your class test because uh, that will be against the rules and regulations. Uh, so we'll talk about the format again later after our revision. So for now, uh, please head to the Microsoft Forms to answer the 14 questions. Uh, you are given uh, 20 minutes. And even though this 20 minutes might be short, it's a good practice because your actual test is going to be 20 minutes. And I'll explain that very quickly later why it has to be 20 minutes. Uh, but for now, let's just proceed to the Microsoft Forms and let's answer the questions from question one to question 14. There are two sections, so please answer all of the questions. I'm only going to give attendance for those who attempted today's uh, revision class. OK, before we head to the revision, any questions? If there are no questions, let us just head to the revision. So I just want to, to ask the question. The act, act mm -hmm. until 14 is the question based on the 1 over 7, 1 until 7. Wait, wait uh, come again? I mean the add until add until fourteen is the is is looking at one over seven question. Uh okay. Uh, let me repeat that again. Uh the okay. So you have two sections. Uh you yeah. have fourteen questions. Uh one to seven is just true and false. You're going to read the scenario and the statement, and you're going to decide if the scenario and statement they are true or they are false. Yeah. Okay. Uh, as easy as that. And then 8 to 14 is just basically listing down. Uh, it's just a short response question. You can refer to your slides if you want to. Or oh. if you want to recall from your memory, that's also fine. OK, OK. OK, okay make sense? Yeah. OK. Thank you. OK, welcome. All right, so let's uh, spend the next 20 minutes. So I think it's around 8.40 now. So we'll stop at 9 a.m. So once we uh, are done at 9 a.m., we'll come back here and discuss all of the questions. And I'll give you further hints for your actual class test. OK, uh, let's uh, proceed to your revision questions. Uh, you have 20 minutes starting from now.
Okay, yeah, uh, I, I think I've received your responses. Okay, so what we're going to do now is, uh, okay, I've identified some of the questions based on your answers, uh, and I will go through uh, some of them for the first section because uh, I think most of the questions in the first sections, some of them, I think all of you or almost all of you answer it correctly with uh, an exception of a couple, but I noticed some of you just answered through there. You just chose one answer, so I'm not going to count that as wrong answers. And we're also going to move on to section number two uh, to look at where the answers are and some of the possible answers uh, that uh, you could have uh, provided. So some of the questions we'll just go through very quickly. Some of the questions where more of you uh, got it wrong, uh, we'll probably discuss uh, why it's wrong, why it's uh, not wrong, and so on. Hi, sir, can I quickly uh, pray? Yeah, uh, go, uh, go ahead, uh, Asfar. Uh, wait, uh, do you need a five-minute break here before we do revision? Uh, before we discuss, I got two MCQs wrong. Okay, yeah, I will address why uh, they are wrong and I'll just hint what topic they are and then um, what we have to know for your class test. I know it isn't exactly the same as the test, but uh, did the form cover all of uh, the content for the test? Uh, Samuel, good question. Uh, all right, I would say 80% of the actual class test is going to rev is going to be similar to what we are doing today. There will still be one, two or three questions uh, that are going to be a surprise because I not I cannot include everything here. Uh, so I would say around 70 to 80% it's going to be similar to what you have done today. Uh, obviously, the question is going to be different. It's just going to be similar. Uh, the choices is going to be different as well, but it's going to be covering the uh, similar topic. Uh, so it's not everything. Uh, I would say around 70 to 80 percent of it covers the topic that we are doing today. And there will be an additional around 20 to 30 percent uh, will be something completely new, uh, but I'll direct to you later with uh, ch which chapter you can focus on uh, for your revision for the actual class test. OK, so let's begin with the uh, discussion first. Uh, so we'll go through uh, the MCQs first. And like I said, most of your questions in your class test, it's going to be similar to this. Most of your questions, uh, since they are multiple choice, I'm going to give you scenarios like this. And based on the scenarios, you are either going to choose uh, the theory that is, that is involved, whether or not the scenario is appropriate, whether or not the scenario is ethical, not ethical, and so on. And I might also give you like one theory. Like for example, I'll um, tell you like um, uh, critical uh, listening, blah, 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 is this. Identify which scenario fits under critical listening as an example. Uh, so we'll go through some of the questions first. And the questions that most of you got it correct, we'll just quickly skip. The questions that most of you got wrong, uh, we'll discuss further in class. OK, so let's look at question number one. So question number one uh, here, let's say you're giving a speech, you're, you're a diabetic patient, and you're struggling with that and you want to include your own personal experience of struggling with diabetes to encourage people to live a healthier lifestyle. 
Okay, this is a good speech uh, to persuade the audience. Uh, I think four of you got wrong, but most of you got it correct. Uh, if, let's say, you're talking about something that you can definitely relate or your audience know that, oh, you've gone through it, then it's a bit more credible. So all of this uh, goes under credibility. So it is a good way to persuade the audience. But obviously, it's not enough, but it's a good way to persuade the audience because uh, this makes your audience become more, sorry, this makes your speech become more persuasive and credible. So question number one is going to be true, but most of you got it uh, correct. Okay, very good. Okay, number two, I think more of you got it wrong. Okay, so here, let's say we are giving a speech about uh, the effects of COVID-19. Okay, and you uh, made up a study that states there is no evidence saying that wearing facial masks is effective in flattening the curve. Okay, um, even though this is a good way to persuade the audience, but here it's probably not very ethical. You're not supposed to do that, um, including any information that is false. Okay, that is considered as unethical. Okay, obviously it's going to be persuasive, but it's going to be highly unethical because uh, no matter where you go online, uh, there will be tons of evidence that tells us that wearing a mask is effective in flattening the curve. So when you made up a study saying, oh, it does not work, Okay, uh, then it becomes unethical. Obviously, wearing a mask is not the only thing that is effective in flattening the curve. There are other things like getting vaccinated and staying at home and following other SOPs, but we cannot make up a study to persuade people just because it's going to be persuasive. So in this case, the answer is false because it is going to be persuasive but it's going to be highly unethical because this is false information. No matter where you go now, um, a lot of experts are saying wearing a mask are effective, even right now. I assume all of you are vaccinated, maybe one dose or two dose. You still have to wear masks even if you go out because it's highly effective to uh, protect you from COVID-19. So the answer here is going to be false because it's unethical. Okay, so here some of you got it wrong. Okay, so we have an update. Uh, some of you got it wrong. I think five of you got it wrong. But here, let's say you are talking about dangers of alcohol addiction. Uh, you decide to quote a statement provided by local doctors. Okay, and this is an example of a good speech to persuade uh, the audience. Okay, most of you got it correct, and this is a good example to persuade your audience. Because if you're talking about alcohol addiction and you take statements provided by local doctors, they are definitely experts. They know how alcohol affects your body. They've learned, obviously, everyone knows about this, but they've learned in further detail on how it affects our body scientifically. So if you quote whatever doctors are saying, it is going to be credible. Yeah. Oh, who is that? Okay, I think that's probably a mistake. Uh, so it's unethical if you make up a study. Yeah, it's uh, unethical. Uh, like for example, let's say uh, right now, if I'm telling you that, um, okay, let's say I'm talking about, um, let's say I'm talking about uh, mental uh, illnesses, all right? Uh, let's say I'm talking about depression or any kind of illness or illnesses or disorder, for example. Uh, let's say I just make up a fact uh, and then I tell you uh, they have no evidence that says that uh, studying or doing assignments can lead to uh, stress and depression which is something I just made up. I'm pretty sure assignments and study can lead to depression because you uh, study a lot, you focus a lot, and that very 
according to different people. So it can add your stress. But if I tell you it does not, then it's unethical because I'm making up a study. Uh, it's a bit different compared to if I take a study that's not credible. Like for example, if I tell you that your neighbor tells you that studying does not lead to depression. Okay, if your neighbor is not someone that's credible, if your neighbor is just someone who uh, maybe heard uh, reads from WhatsApp or social media, then it's different. It's uh, not credible. Okay, and obviously it's unethical because we take information from sources that are known to be untrustworthy. Websites like um, Facebook, social media, WhatsApp, we cannot take all of this information from there. So it's unethical, it's uh, not reliable, so we cannot make up study at all. Making up a study means adding those things. Yes, it does not exist. You just make up because you want to persuade. Like if I'm telling you right, right now, studying does not lead to depression. Okay, I'm pretty sure if you go online, there are a lot of people that say studying too hard can lead to depression. If I create a study that does not exist, that's highly unethical. Okay, so going back to question number three, this is true because you can take statements given by local doctors. It's highly credible in this situation. But obviously, if the situation changes a little bit, if you are talking about something, uh, let's say about uh, uh, becoming an entrepreneur, or let's say you are talking about engineering, for example, and then you quote whatever your local doctors are saying, probably it's not a very good example because maybe they have no experience or they have never learned anything that relates with engineering. So in that case, it's going to be less of a good speech. But in this case, the effect of alcohol on our body, local doctors, this is true because uh, it's highly credible to take experts' opinions that relate with the topic. Okay, so here, uh, I think some of you got it wrong. Uh, so seven of you got it wrong, but most of you still got it right. So in this case, Sally thinks that Apple, uh, Apple products are lousy and need a lot of improvements. Okay, she decides to use her platform at a school to complain and criticize about Apple. Okay, and among the audience are the staff and also the founders of the Apple company. Okay, uh, why is this example is not ethical? Okay, let's discuss this very quickly. Okay, in this particular situation, why is it considered as unethical to complain about Apple products in a speech at a school when you know the staff and also the founders from Apple are there. Uh, wrong place and time. <laughs> Yuan Meng, uh, I think I say true. Okay, it's fine if you say true. Uh, we're discussing. Uh, but I want to mention what Samuel mentioned here. It's a, it is a wrong place and a wrong time. Okay, if let's say uh, you are giving a speech at a school, uh, you know that the staff and founders of the Apple company are going to visit your school on that day. You choose that time to complain about their products. Okay, this is a wrong place and wrong time because number one, that's not why you are giving speeches in the first place. And number two, you have to remember this uh, founders of Apple, uh, no matter what your opinion is, uh, uh, even though I'm using Apple, Apple, I, I use iPhone. I don't think it's a, it's a very good brand. Uh, but if I take this chance to tell everyone, including the founders, that, hey, your brand is not very good, a lot of improvements uh, you still need to provide. It can be very embarrassing for the founders because these are their products. So it's the same with all of you. Uh, let's say if you have a business, uh, all right? Uh, let's say you sell cakes, for example. And then your friends um, 
tell you that your cakes are not very good in front of a huge audience, in front of a lot of people. Obviously, it's going to be very embarrassing. And number two, you can complain, but this is not the way that we complain. Uh, usually, Apple products, you can always email them saying, hey, uh, your product is not very good and it's going to be less embarrassing for them because uh, the other people from outside, they cannot go through this. So in this situation, it's unethical because embar it's embarrassing for them. And let's look at some of you as well because she's at the wrong place. Correct. Wrong place, we cannot use school speech to complain about Apple. But let's say in our class, uh, if you know none of the founders and Apple um, uh, founders of Apple and staff of a Apple company are here, it still might be unethical because we still might have people who love iPhone here. So in our case, it still can be quite controversial as well. You might turn off certain people. Uh, so in this particular situation, it's wrong because she is creating br a bad brand image, correct? It can also hurt the feelings of the employees and founders. Uh, yeah, correct, I do agree. We can say that Apple is not a very good product. It's fine, that's okay. You can complain, but in this case, it can hurt their feelings. I think she should complain at Apple Feedback Online, not at school, correct. Uh, so if you're using this chance to complain about Apple products, it's highly unethical because we don't know how they will take your complaints. And probably it's not going to be effective as well because if you embarrass the founders, maybe they will not take that into consideration because they're embarrassed. And I think we've discussed about this quite a few times. If you put people on the spot, if you offend people when you're giving a speech, it's less effective. And when you want to complain about a particular product, you want to make sure it's effective. So I do agree with Samuel. If we were to complain here, uh, it's not the good time and the good place to do it. You can complain it on their website. Okay, so that's number four. That's why this is false. It's not considered as ethical at all. Okay, uh, the next one, uh, a lot of people uh, got it wrong as well here. Uh, 11 of you got it wrong. Okay, uh, so here we are going to focus at a certain part of, from this uh, statement. Okay, Andy is giving a speech at his school and the audience will be a mix of students with different nationalities. Okay, he decides to talk about his country and plans to say that his country has the best cities compared to any other places in the world. Okay, uh, this is an example of an ethical speech to inform the audience. Okay, um, I said that this is false because of few reasons. But let's discuss here. Uh, why is this considered wrong or unethical? Okay, like for example, right now I'm a Malaysian, all right? I'm giving a speech. And I'm telling you that uh, Malaysia has the best cities or the best culture or whatever compared to any other places in the world. Okay, uh, this is uh, this so raising. Ah, uh, yeah, basically here we are raising an issue in a sense that we are comparing. That's number one. And when you know your audience is going to be a mix of different culture, we cannot do that. You can say that your country is good in your opinion, but there's a way to phrase it. Uh, Samuel said superiority. Okay, very good. Uh, here it's basically you're saying that your country is more superior than others because you are directly comparing. And uh, if you recall, we learned something that is called uh, ethnocentrism. Uh, I think that is in our first uh, chapter. Uh, you can go through this later. Let me find out. I think it's here. Okay. Uh, it's in your first introduction uh, chapter, uh, which is ethnocentrism. This is where you tell people that whatever beliefs, race, culture, 
uh, that you have is better than the others. It's okay to have this feeling. Obviously, everyone will probably have this opinion, their culture or their race or their uh, country is better than the others. And that's fine. We can include that in our daily conversation if you know your friends are able to take it. But in a speech where there's a mix of different uh, culture, okay, this is ethnocentrism because you're basically saying that your culture is superior than the others. In this case, it can offend a lot of people and it can be a destructive force, kind of like what... Um, uh, Trump usually does. And then I'm pretty sure you know uh, this guy, this is Uncle Roger. This is also a form of ethnocentrism. When you say that there's only one right way to do things or when you're saying that other people's culture or experience are not very good. So this is ethnocentrism because you feel that you are superior and that's all right. It's common that people feel superior, but you choose to talk about it in a speech. Then it can become offensive. Um, yeah, it's also a little bit of arrogance there as well. So would it be ethical if you said one of the best uh, or great city? Talk about it. It's good and don't compare. Yeah, I usually suggest if you want to say that your cities are the best, there are a few ways that you can do this. Okay, number one, do it without comparing with other city. Uh, let's say as a Malaysian. I feel that uh, Malaysia has great food. So when I tell you that Malaysia has great food, I'm not comparing. I'm just telling you, hey, Malaysia is rich in culture and we have a variety of different food that I love. Okay, I'm not trying to imply that other countries, they are not rich in culture and they do not have great food. Then that's fine. You can tell people without comparing. But the moment if I tell you, I'm sorry for any Singaporeans here, but let's say I give you an example. Okay, Malaysian food is better than Singaporean food, as an example. Okay, that's where it becomes a problem because you're directly comparing. Okay, so that's number one. Okay, number two, you can tell people that your culture is great, but provide evidence. Like, for example, Singapore... Um, according to a lot of articles and a lot of uh, evidence, uh, Singapore is known to have one of the cleanest airports all over the world. Okay, and provide the facts. Who said this? And then how did they come to this conclusion saying that Singapore has the best or the cleanest airport in the world? Explain a little bit. So basically, you can do this in two ways. Number one, without comparing. Number two, providing credible source. Like, for example, if we have conducted a survey and people say that, oh, Singapore has the cleanest airport. And this survey is based on people who have traveled to uh, different countries in the world. Then it becomes a bit more credible because it is based on other people's opinion. But you cannot simply just say, oh, my country has the best this compared to your country. Okay, that's ethnocentrism and we don't want that. Okay, so this is basically ethnocentrism. You can check this out later. Okay, so that's question number five. And I think uh, question number six, we can uh, move very quickly because not a lot of you got it wrong here. Uh, but here, if you want to talk about violent movies and uh, behavior and your specific purpose here is you want to persuade the audience to believe that watching violence movie will promote aggressive behavior uh, in our daily life, uh, an arrow there, in our daily life by pro providing personal experience and factual information from online research. This is a specific purpose because you know, okay, you want to persuade the audience telling them that, oh, watching violent movies can be bad and you have decided, I want to provide uh, this speech by providing my own personal experience 
and you're going to include factual information. So this is uh, a specific purpose. So let's go through that question very quickly. Okay, seven. All right, so seven is basically uh, quite simple as well. Here, Maria's friend is giving a speech on advantages of online shopping. Okay, if let's say Maria, she uh, intends to listen to the speech to be able to evaluate and decide if she wants to accept the idea or not. Uh, this is a bit more theoretic, uh, theoretical because critical response or critic, sorry, critical purpose means uh, so can we say that as like that place was good, but this is great. Um, I will usually not encourage you to provide any kind of uh, comparison, but this is what we call as a backhanded compliment. Uh, so what we mean by backhanded compliment is um, Singaporeans food is bet uh, good, but Malaysians food is better. So this is what we mean by backhanded compliment, uh, we compliment them, but at the same time, we're saying, well, it's probably not that good. It can work, but in my opinion, it still can be offensive uh, because you're basically saying it's good, but there are a lot of other things that are better. So it's not very um, ethical in that particular situation because you could have just mentioned that their food is good. And then you can also mention my culture. My food is good. So you can do it without comparing. OK, so here going back to critical listening. Okay, Critical listening is just uh, evaluating. And information uh, to decide if they're uh, right or wrong in your opinion. So this one is quite theoretical um, because when you listen for critical purposes, you want to see, okay, is this person saying something good, not good, why? Okay, then that is critical purposes. Okay, so that's the end of the first uh, section. Okay, let's go through uh, the second uh, section. Okay, this one, I've gone through some of your answers earlier. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to tell you where to get the answers and I'll list some of the um, correct answer. And the first one and the second one, they are related. Uh, similarity between a speech and difference between a speech. Uh, make sure you know this because this will definitely turn up in your test. And this can be accessed uh, through your first uh, chapter. Okay, so your first chapter has a particular topic that provides you similarities and differences. So the few similarities is both a speech and a daily conversation. You still have to organize your thoughts logically. You still have a message. You are still telling, uh, telling a story for impact. And you are still adapting to listeners' feedback. Like, for example, when you are conversing, obviously, when you see someone is surprised, you change the way that you say something. Same goes with a speech. When you see that or your audience is not paying attention or listening, then you change. So similarities is some of these. And let's look at differences. Differences is a speech is usually highly structured. It's more formal, meaning you cannot use jargons or internet slang. You cannot use all of that. Bad grammar, you cannot use this as well. And then the last uh, one is going to be delivery method. Delivery method is going to be different. It's more formal. Okay, uh, your voices need to be projected loudly. Your posture needs to be confident, which is different than daily conversation. It does not matter how you communicate in daily life. And you cannot have too much of a body language when you are speaking. You need to have it, 
but not to the point that your hand moves all over the place. So that's very distracting. So for question number eight and nine, that will be the similarities and differences. OK, let's look at question number 10. OK, question number 10 is one advantage for extemporaneous uh, speech delivery. I think most of you got this correctly. Uh, extemporaneous uh, speech is basically something that you prepare your speech, but when you are presenting your speech, you become a bit more flexible. You change a couple of words here and there. And this can be accessed uh, from uh, your uh, week six delivery chapter. And extemporaneous speech is here. This is where you prepare, but during the speech, you might change a couple of words you include in the speech. And there's a lot of advantages here. It gives you a lot of control. It makes your speech sound more spontaneous. Okay, you are also able to adapt to different situations. And most of you answered this one. It gives a conversational quality in your speech. It sounds like you are talking to someone and you also have full control over your ideas, meaning you can change anything last minute if you want to. OK, so these are some of the advantages so you can get it or access this information from your chapter delivery. OK, it was conducted in week six. So later I'll tell you where to get all of these slides. OK, question number 11. OK, uh, I think this one is a bit more difficult for most of you because some of you, uh, I think most of you said accidental plagiarism. Uh, this is something that you learned in PDSM and it's correct. But when it comes to uh, our public speech, uh, we have three types of plagiarism. We have global plagiarism where you steal the speech entirely and then you are telling people that this is your own speech. Patchwork plagiarism is where you steal ideas from different places and you claim it as your own speech. Incremental plagiarism is just accidental plagiarism. You forgot to give credit to the sources. So for this class, we are going to use these three types of plagiarism. Uh, accidental plagiarism is correct, that is basically another name for incremental plagiarism as an example. Okay, uh, direct plagiarism is also another name for a uh, global plagiarism. But in this class, we are going to use these three terms if it turns out in your uh, class test. So make sure to remember if we are talking about plagiarism is this three. OK, after that, uh, obviously this one um, is the easiest out of, the, out of it and it's going to definitely turn out in your test. I thought it's just one bonus mark, one bonus mark for all of you during the test. Uh, but we have three. I wrote complete plagiarism. Complete plagiarism is basically another word for uh, global plagiarism. But in this class, we are using this term. It's not wrong, it's just not accurate to the theory that we've learned. And for you, it's going to be multiple choice questions. So it's going to be like very objective in the terms that you have to know. OK, uh, going back to three purposes. Uh, obviously, you know this. Um, number one is to inform OK, number two is to persuade and number three is to entertain. You might have to remember one of these or you might have to remember all of these three. It depends because your question is going to be multiple choice question, but we only uh, will accept any of these three answers. OK, this, uh, the last two are also related. Audience analysis. Uh, demographic and also nonverbal. This is what we learned in week five, which is called audience analysis. So the only audience analysis that you have to remember is this three: demographic, situational, and nonverbal. 
Demographic is our culture, basically, uh, our diversity. Uh, but we are going to use the term demographic. We have age, gender, religion, sexual orientation, and a lot of different things. Situational audience analysis is uh, the length of presentation, our audience size, the place of the presentation, the topic. So this is based on situations and places. The last one is nonverbal audience analysis. Uh, when you're giving your speech, what is your body gesture and how uh, is your audience reacting to your speech through their body um, gestures? The eye contact, facial expression, movement, and then any other nonverbal responses, like maybe if they're blinking too much, that means something. Uh, maybe if they are yawning, that means something. So the only audience analysis that you have to remember are these three. So for demographic, is basically age, gender, ethnicity, uh, our gen uh, gender is there, and our sexual orientation, occupation, all of this fall under demographic. Nonverbal is, okay, some of you got this correct, facial expression and body language, anything that relates with our gestures and expressions that does not rely on the use of um, exact words. So these are all the uh, questions that you did for today. Can clothing be included? Yes, clothing is under nonverbal audience analysis. Because if I wear like bright colors, uh, I'm sending a signal through the colors and it can affect people differently. Or if I'm wearing revealing outfits, that's also a nonverbal um, body language or uh, analysis. Because let's say if you as the speaker, you wear something that's very re uh, revealing in a Malaysian school setting, it can be very uncomfortable for some of your audience. Because you know, Malaysians or Asians in general, we are a bit more conservative. So clothing, can be nonverbal uh, form of communication. Uh, the form of clothing um, and then the color of your clothing, the type of your clothing, and then whether you look messy, not messy. So all of those fall under nonverbal audience analysis. Okay, so these are some of the questions that you did for today. Okay, and uh, let's talk about where to get all of your information. So we'll talk about this very quickly. Um, so when you go to your lecture, okay, just go to files and go to class materials. Okay, from there you will see all of the chapters that we have covered. Okay, but for all of you, a test is on the week 12. I know Saant. Test is next week. Uh, the reason why test is going to be next week is because 19 is a public holiday. So I have to do this next week. Uh, test will be on 12th of October. Which week are we in? Okay, uh, we are in week 10. Uh, today is week 10. Uh, next week is week 11. But since uh, 19, which is your week 12, is a public holiday, so I have to do your test next week. Usually we will do in week 12, but in your case, uh, we will have it next week. Uh, during a lecture, uh, your uh, tutorial class uh, will be used for your a uh, group uh, symposium presentations. Same week as quiz. Um, we will only have one class test, uh, Yishun. Uh, so we will only have class test next week and it's going to be during lecture. Okay, I'll talk about that very soon, but it's going to be next week on 12th. Our presentation is going to be next week. Uh, your tutorial class, Next week, we will start with our group presentation. Uh, your tutorials will be used 
strictly only for your presentations. I will not disturb that uh, to conduct your clusters. Your lecture next week, since it will be our last lecture, it will only be our class test. In class, will it be MCQs or true or false? Uh, all of it will be MCQs. Okay, so for your actual class tests, uh, MCQ questions, um, all of your questions uh, for your test uh, will be MCQs uh, with uh, four options. So it will be A, B, C, and D basically, but all of it will be multiple choice questions. But uh, I would say that most of the questions are going to be in this form. I will give you some kind of scenario, and then you're going to choose the correct answer. Or what I'm going to do as well, um, let's say I give you um a theory let's say i tell you identify which of the situation is critical listening and then you have to identify which situation falls under critical listening so it will be similar to question number one to seven of what you did today so next week is just class tests. uh yes uh we've covered everything uh, next week is just class test, uh, but after your class test, I will uh, use the remaining time to talk about your co-curricular studies uh, submission. Uh, I'll try to see if Ms. Rutira can join uh, because we will be your coordinators for your co-curricular studies. And I'm pretty sure I will not meet you in the third semester, so I want to finish everything by next week so that you can start working on your co-curricular studies. So that one, no need to worry. Uh, after the class test, uh, just sit for the briefing and we'll discuss about your core curricular studies. But that one, no need to pay attention yet. We're just going to do the briefing next week. I like MCQs. I think MCQs is a bit more difficult, uh, but all right. OK, so going back to your chapters, uh, you don't have to cover everything. Uh, just cover from week one until week six. Uh, as for your chapters, cover uh, the slides from week one to week six. So later when you do your revision, it's only going to be from introduction, ethics, choosing topic and supporting materials audience analysis, and also delivery. Uh, group presentation and language, I decided not to include any of that in your test. Uh, so you can uh, just read from week one until week six of chapter. Uh, these two things will not come up in any way at all in your test. So you can stop up until here when you're doing your revision. OK, so that's number one. Uh, OK, number two, your test will be next week on uh, Tuesday. OK, uh, one thing that I want to ask is. Uh, do you want me uh, to open the class test uh, longer? The duration is still going to be 20 minutes, but do you want me to allow you to attempt after the class as well? Uh, for those, OK, yes, uh, for those who are not in Malaysia, what's the uh, duration? Um, let's say if we open for six hours, is that fine? Okay, let me see. Uh, 9, 10, 11, 12, 1, 2. 
Uh, okay, uh, for those who are not currently in Malaysia, if we open from 8.30 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. Uh, Malaysia time, uh, it, will this be convenient? Oh, thank you. Um, don't... <laughs> All right, it's fine. Uh, all right, uh, can we open 8.30 a.m. to 2.30 p.m.? Um, those who are not in Malaysia, let me know, is this timing all right? Yes, I think 8.30 a.m. for some of you probably is going to be like 2 a.m. So I'm not sure if that's the best time to take tests. Okay, if this is fine, I'll set it uh, from 8.30 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. Malaysia time, all right? Okay. Uh, yes, correct. Uh, Malaysia time, as far. You deserve the Ballon d'Or. I, I don't know what that is. Okay. Okay, so basically, uh, we will open attempt from 8.30 a.m. to 2.30 uh, p.m. Malaysia time, but your attempt is still going to be 20 minutes. There will be 15 MCQs. Okay, so we will open attempt from 8.30 a.m. Malaysia time to 2.30 p.m. Malaysia time. Uh, but once you have uh, started the attempt, it's going to be 20 minutes. Uh, and Jamil, I cannot keep it to 30 minutes because APU's guideline now, if it's under 15 questions or up until 15 questions, it has to only be 20 minutes. But here's what I will do. Uh, 20 minutes attempt time, 10 minutes uh, grace uh, period uh, to submit the question. So uh, Jamil, I'm very sorry, the duration I cannot change because this is uh, the guideline provided by APU. Uh, but what it means is you have 20 minutes to answer all of the question. Up until 20 minutes ends, you cannot answer any questions anymore, so you have an additional 10 minutes to submit, uh, just in case your internet connection is not very good. Uh, you will get your result for your class test instantly. Um, once you have submitted, uh, the test will be released after, uh, the marks will be released after 2.30 p.m. I thought it would be attempt. <laughs> no, I cannot do that, Sadar. Um, uh, APU does not allow that. Um, you can attempt at any time. So if you don't want to start answering your test at 8.30, uh, you can answer it later. But once you have started your attempt, it's still going to be 20 minutes. Will the questions be same for everyone? Why, Sadar, are you planning to cheat? All right. Uh, if you're planning to cheat, don't do that uh, because I've set the setting. If you close your tab or anything, uh, your class test will be sent uh, immediately. Um, so just curious. Mm. All right. Um, Maybe, maybe not. I cannot answer that question. So that means the next group will... Group presentation. Uh, yes, correct, Jamil. Group presentation and class test, they all will be uh, next week.
close your tab or minimize your tab. Uh, close and minimize uh, both are the same thing. Uh, so when you are answering your test, do not minimize your tab. Uh, if let's say you have one tab, uh, okay, let me just show an example. Okay, let's say this is your tab. Uh, the moment you minimize, the answers will be sent immediately and then you cannot attempt anymore. So do not minimize for whatever reasons um, to check your slides or to check with your friends, anything at all, do not minimize because that's the rule that APU provides. I cannot uh, change the setting. Uh, so do not minimize and do not close your tab. Uh, you can use different device. All right, uh, I mean, that's up to you. Um, but if let's say you have, um, if let's say you have internet connection problems, let me know. Uh, but here's one thing as well, a, a very short disclaimer. Uh, Tuesday, I will have like a lot of back-to-back -back classes. 10.45, I will have class. Uh, 2 p.m., I will have class. So if you feel that your internet connection is not very fast, uh, please come online at 8.30 a.m. so that I can try to solve your problems if your internet connection is usually not very good. If your internet connection is usually very fast, you can answer at any time. Uh, because after that, I will be busy with the other classes and also if you answer during lunch hour, I might not be able to help you if there's any internet connection. So I'm still encouraging you to answer at 8.30 a.m. Malaysia time if your internet connection is usually not very strong. If you're confident in your internet connection, then that's fine. And one more thing, if there's an issue with internet connection, just wait a couple of seconds for it to refresh. Usually that will happen. So our presentation. Uh, yes, Kai Feng. Both presentations and class tests will start next week. Presentations only in uh, tutorial, class tests only during a lecture, but attempt will be opened from 8.30 to 2.30 uh, p.m. All right, so uh, any other questions regarding your class test and also your presentations? Okay, your presentations, don't worry too much because I'll clarify again uh, during our class this week. Uh, but any other questions regarding your class test? Okay, if there's no other questions. All right, <laughs> it's all right. Uh, okay, if you think that something bad might happen to you and your internet connection, I suggest answering from 8.30 uh, to 9 because I'll be able to help you uh, quickly with your internet connection at that time if you feel your internet connection is not very good. Okay, so for today, uh, attendance will be given manually based on the submission of your revision. So I will dismiss all of you here first for today. All the best for your group presentations starting next week during tutorial class and all the best for your class test starting next week during uh, lecture class from 8.30 a.m. to 2.30 uh, p.m. Uh, thank you, sir. Bye-bye. Thank you. Welcome. Goodbye, you too. Uh, Sadar, uh, no. Um, the order of the presentation we will discuss in your tutorial class, Sadar. Thank you, sir. Okay, uh, welcome. Have a good day, everyone. Um, have a good revision. I will see you all again very soon.